Excellencies, Dashos, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends all, I am delighted to welcome you to this uh, distinguished lecture on uh, Bhutan uh, Development with Dignity and the Gross National Happiness Index. For those of you who have just joined us, thank you so much for uh, coming out in the cold and before term. For those of you who have been here all afternoon, I do hope that you enjoyed the music and the refreshments. Um, I would like to simply introduce and recognize the Vice Chancellor of Oxford, Professor Louise Richardson, who will chair this session and introduce our speaker. Good evening, everyone. Prime Minister Tabge, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Oxford's Sheldonian Theatre, which many of you may know was designed by Christopher Wren 355 years ago. If I could draw your attention to the painting on the ceiling, it is by the court painter of Charles II, Robert Streeter, and it depicts truth descending on the arts and sciences to expel ignorance from the university. It would be difficult to imagine a more appropriate venue for this evening's lecture. I'm deeply honored and it gives me great pleasure to have been asked to introduce to you our speaker this evening. Dasho Karma Ura graduated from Magdalen College where he read PPE in the late 1980s. He worked for the Bhutanese Ministry of Planning for 12 years before becoming the director of the Center for Bhutan Studies and gross national happiness from its foundation in 1999. Karma Ura was a member of the drafting committee for Bhutan's first constitution, which was enacted in July 2008. He was awarded the red scarf and the ancient title of distinction, Dasho, for his service to the country by His Majesty the Fourth King, the present King's father, in his abdication honors in December 2006. In 2010, he was granted the honor of Druk Korlo by His Majesty the King for his contributions to literature and fine arts. His several books include technical works, uh, such as a proposal for GNV value education in schools, and most recently, a compass towards a just and harmonious society, as well as a historical novel, The Hero with a Thousand Eyes, and a history of the Bhutanese royal family, leadership of the wise kings of Bhutan. Dr. Ura is distinctive in his ability to engage with the world outside academia, as well as with his academic colleagues. For example, he composed a special Che Tu, or annual spiritual festival, which is celebrated in Dorkura, and involves choreographing dance, music composition, costume, and mass design to convey a meaningful spiritual narrative. He is also a nationally recognized painter and has designed the wall paintings for the temple in Dorkula, which tell the story of the history of Bhutan. The topic of his lecture tonight is Bhutan's practical application of the idea of gross national happiness. The phrase gross national happiness was coined by His Majesty the Fourth King of Bhutan in 1972, who thought it a better maximum than gross national product. As Bhutan turned towards democracy in the 2000s, the question emerged how to define GNH and make it policy salient. This remains an apt question today, which is why we are delighted to have the participation as commentators of Martin Duran, Chief Statistician of the OECD, and James Foster, Professor of Economics at George Washington University. The development of the original GNH index was a research project with, we are proud to say, some Oxford involvement. Sabina Kire in the Department of International Development was one of those involved. She has organized this conference, which is celebrating the launch under her chairmanship of the International Society of Bhutan Studies. The ISBS will seek to develop the study of Bhutanese culture, life, and nature in all its aspects and encourage, inspire, and motivate academic interest in these. GNH has attracted considerable attention in Brazil, Canada, and the US, especially from green activists, as a potential way of encouraging people to think about how society can prosper without constant economic growth. A number of governments, especially Thailand and the Philippines, have also been engaging actively with GNH. 
This evening, we have as our speaker someone who embodies many dimensions of happiness. Engineer, poet, economist, planner, biographer, novelist, choreographer, and religious historian. Please join me in welcoming Dasho Karma Ura to speak on the subject of development with integrity, Bhutan's development and its gross national happiness index. Professor Ruth Richardson, Vice Chancellor, Oxford University. Sir David Clary and Lady Clary, President of Modern College and his spouse. My philosophy tutor from 30 years ago, Dr. Ralph Walker. Uh, Dr. James Foster, who has come all the way from Washington across the Atlantic. Uh, Dr. Martin Duran, Chief Statistician, OECD. And many other distinguished guests. and the gracious uh, presence of all of you is a great honor. But at the same time, because of that fact, a little bit uneasy for me also. Uh, I th want to thank, first of all, uh, Sabina al Kair, the first president of the International Society for Bhutan Studies who is also a fellow researcher in uh, GNH, as Vice Chancellor has just mentioned, for encouraging me to speak um, at this marvelous Sheldonian theater. I actually saw this structure some 29 years ago. After I reached here, one gray evening. It was, Bhutan was very different at that time. I came to take up Maudlin College's uh, JCR Third World Scholarship. And I must say that I owe so much to Maudlin College and to Oxford University. And at the time, I made the scholarship application. I committed myself voluntarily to serve my country. And after I finished PPE, I went to do a master's uh, and fill. And I had been working, uh, fruitfully or not, for the last 29 years in my country. His Majesty the King of Bhutan also, as uh, former Prime Minister mentioned, uh, studied here. And we all feel very thrilled today that this inaugural conference of ISBIS uh, could be held at this university. And we like to thank very much uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor and Sir David Clary for uh, the support. I actually, uh, when I reached here 29 years ago, no, more, more than that, 30, 31 years ago, uh, the moment was uh, politically very different. Uh, it was a time of uh, so-called Thatcher Revolution. And incidentally, I find uh, myself uh, rather struck by the fact that I am at the time of 
uh, Brexit again. Um, some may like to draw some connections between those events. But when I look back over the last 30 years, I'm tempted to think that there are two significant events, trends that have taken place. One is positive and one is negative, I think. On the negative one, around the globe, uh, we have been inured to unsparing news about calamities, uh, mainly due to climate change. And if we do not correct the economies, uh, it seems to me the shadow of more chaotic nature, churning of oceans and atmosphere in a chaotic way could be more in the future. The positive trends relate to the increasing research in the last 30 years in what is known as a quality of life, uh, uh, happiness and well-being. And both of these things uh, instigate uh, new thinking, rethinking about the purposes of economies and the role of government in the future. So my intention in this humble lecture uh, is to describe, if I could, within the available 40 minutes or so, the relationship between subjective well-being, GDP, and GNH. And to summarize, subjective well-being's status as far as we know from Bhutanese data. And further to go over institutional background of cross-national happiness, and also to give an account of the structure and aggregated methods, aggregation methods of GNH. And finally, to provide a glimpse of the official uses of GNH index. And lastly, before I conclude, I would like to uh, say something brief about the changes within the GNH, means changes in the country as seen from the uh, um, GNH index. Uh, I'm very grateful to the former Prime Minister because uh, the background uh, he painted uh, really makes it a little easier for you to consume the information I'm about to provide. Uh, I always think that uh, painting background is very important in order to establish the foreground, because foreground is contained in the background, actually. So I thank the Prime Minister for doing that. So let me begin by talking about the uh, structure of uh, GNH indicator. Uh, how it measures uh, the things, and what does it measure differently um, uh, from GDP or subjective well-being. Um, so, so it's kind of trying to uh, triangulate, uh, triangular view instead of seeing each of these in isolation. As you know, Bhutan had already launched the GNH index before 1910, it actually launched it in 2008. But in 2010, uh, Stiglitz, Sens, and Pitossi Commission uh, already sized up GDP, and in doing so, urged the improvements in the methodology of national accounts. Uh, with regard to uh, several things like uh, accounting of government expenditure, quality changes in goods and services, omission of household activities, underpricing of environmental goods, spotlighting the unreliability of market prices um, in assessing sustainable economic growth. But their final conclusion, I think, was that 
even if you make all these changes uh, in the methodologies of measurement, the, they concluded that GDP cannot measure societal well-being, and hence there's need for other sets of indicators um, to, for us to know something about societal well-being. So in this regard, I'm very honored and delighted uh, that OECD's chief statistician, uh, Martin Duran, is here. And she has co-authored a follow-up uh, activities on the Stigli Sense Pitosi Commission. Uh, and he has, she has authored, along with uh, Stiglitz and Pitosi, OECD's latest publication, which is called Beyond GDP, Measuring What Counts for Economic and Social Performance. So I really look forward to hearing from her uh, insights from the book and from her indicators, that is OECD's Better Life Indices, in dialogue with GNH Index. But there are also other problems uh, that has emerged since that uh, commission's time. That besides accounting issues of GDP, central bankers and economists are challenged very much today by the lack of recovery of economies to pre-crisis level, crisis of 2007 and 8. And quantitative easing and other tools of demand management have been heavily used to pump up GDP uh, without much effect. On the whole, GDP and its family of indicators are still the primary, not the parallel indicators of progress. So that's where matter is resting at this moment. At the same time, on the other side of the world, uh, in 1983, national accounts estimate of GDP also reached Bhutan. And in Bhutan too, the primacy between GDP and GNH is often debated. Yet it is making progress uh, both at home and internationally. As a sort of alternative accounting framework for well-being and happiness, there are two, I think, uh, World Happiness Report is sort of also a, um, a follow-up on the 2011 resolution of United Nations moved by Bhutan. Uh, World Happiness Report is published every year, and it shows country rankings by life evaluations based on Gallup polls international data. In World Happiness Report, uh, Bhutan is quite low down in ranking, uh, so, some, somewhere like 94, but this is primarily due to unrepresentative sampling of Bhutan by Gallup. Gallup uses uh, country ladder, and Bhutan uses subjective life evolutions. Bhutan's uh, random sample survey, national survey, reliably shows this national average score to be 6.88. And if that is converted to country level, it would match 6.25, which would place Bhutan in the rank of top 40s, not 90s. But the country-based international ranking in World Happiness Report, like GDP, puts countries with high ecological footprint at the top. All rankings, as you know, are popularly inter interpreted 
not only as objective information, but also as social ladders of nations. While nations aspire for higher ranks, uh, the path of development should not involve the same level of carbon intensity in the future. Uh, so there is some unease about that ranking being taken as social positions in the global uh, ladder. Uh, within Bhutanese uh, data, uh, research confirms that uh, there is nonlinear relationship between life evaluations and income. And the marginal utility of income declines with increase in income. Now this has been um, explained by various hypotheses, as you all know, uh, such as uh, overestimation of value of income and goods and services for well-being, adaptation by human beings, uh, relative income effect, and genetically determined set point uh, theory uh, as explanations for this uh, uh, diminishing marginal utility of income. Uh, this hypothesis, based on random control trials, uh, in a way uh, seemed to uh, people like me, uh, uh, Buddhists, uh, to be sort of uh, refreshed versions of uh, Buddha's old revered uh, talking points. Uh, and these talking points are uh, such things as fear of losing you know, what you have cherished, uh, not attaining what you desire, and uh, being left wanting after your desire has been fulfilled. Uh, exploring Bhutanese data uh, through regression analysis on a sample of 8,000 or so, life evaluation in Bhutan is positively related to a set of um, um, independent variables, such as not being divorced or uh, uh, widowed, having college qualification, having income, low financial insecurity, asset ownership, domain satisfaction, positive emotions, social support, healthy days, self-reported health, self-reported spirituality, rural residence. But life evaluation scores are inversely related to disability and to animical relationship in the community and perception of air pollution. Of course, uh, it is quite obvious that you will not feel a sense of satisfaction and well-being if you are involved in uh, um, animosity with members of your community. But uh, sometimes uh, social scientists uh, excel in proving the very obvious things, and this is also a case of that. Uh, but Bhutan also runs uh, other selected questions of interest on happiness uh, in its census with a large sample of 163,000 respondents who are the heads of household. So they were asked uh, last, a year before last, what were the most important determinants of their happiness? Uh, in, uh, what, what more would you want uh, in the future to make you more happy? And they had to choose from a multiple choice uh, item. And uh, uh, 50, the highest was 50% uh, of the respondents said health is the most important determinant for increasing their happiness. 42 said family, 38% said income, and 17% said land. Uh, unlike the US and UK data, um, work uh, is, uh, does not rank amongst the top five or so. And this is because majority of the Bhutanese people are self-employed in farming sector. Um, overall, the factors revealed in this kind of uh, quantitative analysis uh, uh, of self-reported determinants of uh, what would make people happier provide, in my opinion, very limited uh, policy handles, very limited ideas about how to intervene in terms of uh, government's uh, interventions. Uh, 
what we are very much interested in the distribution of variables uh, across different incomes, different locations, different demographies. Uh, that is of much greater interest to policymakers because policy speakers would like to focus on the uh, lower end. So, GNH, uh, uh, which takes a broader set of conditions related to societal and individual happiness. Till 2006, GNH remained uh, dialogic, it remained legislative, with the fourth king of Bhutan, who is the founder of GNH, framing policies which were broadly consistent with GNH, but not quantified. But something else was developing, as Prime Minister said, that the stage was being set for uh, democratically elected governments who could potentially change every five years. So there was uncertainty of things. And it was thought at that time that GNH index could perhaps help in anchoring politicians and bureaucrats uh, to long-term goals of GNH. So that is how the quantification exercise began. And so also, as Prime Minister has already clarified, the concept of nine domains was adopted, and these uh, uh, domains, uh, to repeat, I think, they are psychological well-being, community vitality, time use, ecological resilience, culture, good governance, education, health, and living standard. Uh, these are uh, seemingly uh, itemized separately, but there's profound interdependence and non-linear relationship between the domains and between the variables under each domain. I think each domain, in our view, contains human preference and their satisfiers for happiness that draws both on the mind and body, both on goods and services, both on community and family, and both on culture and ecology. Now, I, just to explain briefly about the aggregation uh, and the structure of the uh, GNH uh, indicators, uh, as Prime Minister mentioned, former Prime Minister mentioned, we run surveys every four years and collect numerous data on various, uh, various uh, variables, but most of them are non-monetary, and are therefore, in my opinion, a bit immune from vulnerability that is a feature of income and price, because they, they move very fast, they respond to the market but these are sort of at one remove. To be more detailed, the GNH survey consists of 135 questions, which elicit 642 answers. The responses come in all type of uh, uh, styles, Likard scale, Likard type, cantilever, dichotomous variable, multiple choice items, open-ended questions, quantitative questions, open-ended quantitative, all divisible into subjective and objective. So given this situation, the aggregation method has to be open to a variety of responses. And this brings me to a uh, remark on three exceptional qualities of the aggregation uh, method that we use, which is al Khair foster aggregation method. Uh, we switched actually to this aggregation method in 2008 uh, after I met Sabina. Before that, we had something else from 2006, which was not very flexible and which could not be decomposed. Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's, uh, this, its openness and flexibility to uh, take in all kind of data types is a very important one. But 
uh, that is allied with another property of the aggregation uh, method, which is fixing threshold. That is for every individual, for every variable, uh, an achievement by person with respect to that variable is dichotomized. If the person achieves it, he is given zero. If the person fails to pass the, that uh, threshold of achievement, is given one. So all sort of uh, data, quantitative, qualitative, Likard scale type, passes through this threshold and it is dichotomized. Once it is dichotomized, uh, then we can perform arithmetic functions on it, resuscitation, averaging, whatever. But it's important to recognize that uh, the uh, uh, th threshold divides the population into achievers of the conditions of happiness and non-achievers of the conditions of happiness. I think this is very central. Um, um, by doing so also, uh, the aggregation method becomes very sensitive to distribution because those who achieve the conditions for happiness are then no longer, uh, 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 they are excluded from further calculation in GNH. This may be very ironic uh, that happy people are excluded from further calculation, but what it does is tells the policy makers that what is priority is to focus on those who do not achieve. So it is very much geared towards distribution. So uh, not only threshold and uh, openness to all sort of data types, the third quality of the uh, uh, aggregation method is the decomposability. That means that not only we can calculate uh, a scalar number index, single number index, which is driven by underlying uh, indicators and variables, the relative performance of that, uh, not only can we have a single number, which conveys the pace and direction of the uh, society with respect to GNH, but uh, that it can be broken down to nth level of individual and nth level of uh, variable. So uh, that becomes uh, very in, 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 uh, interesting because uh, we can see uh, uh, like sort of uh, uh, having many sensors, having many uh, cameras on different states of society, we can zoom down and um, reveal to ourselves um, the situation. Uh, so, uh, in this respect, I'm very, very uh, uh, um, happy that uh, Professor James Foster, who has been working all of his life on uh, this kind of mathematical properties of uh, uh, decomposable indicators has come all the way, and I really look forward to um, uh, a more commentary on uh, this later. Uh, as I mentioned, as I already mentioned, uh, the uh, GNH scalar number index uh, computes or processes a uh, vast number of variables. And the exact number of variables that go into the GNH index is 277. Um, uh, and each variable is also weighted with objective data carrying uh, heavier weight than the um, uh, subjective uh, data. But uh, at the end, each domain is weighted equally. So the psychological well-being is uh, weighted uh, one out of nine. A living standard is also weighted one out of nine. Uh, as you know, that in many other indicators, uh, the income part carries much bigger weight. Uh, for example, human development index care, uh, income part takes one third weight, education one third, health one third. <coughs> so there is a little bit of difference, and I'll come to some kind of just intuitive justification we have for doing those things. Uh, how do we have uh, the compute after computing 
what else do we do with GNH index is uh, the next part I would like to come to. Uh, subjective well-being studies are getting uh, increasingly introduced into official decision making um, in Germany, in UK, uh, United Arab Emirates that I know, and in Bhutan too. Uh, probably there are more countries than I know uh, who are doing this. Um, uh, they come in three uh, ways. Uh, one is the life satisfaction approach. Other is happiness-based uh, cost-effectiveness analysis. Oh, and third one is happiness-based cost-benefit analysis. And I, I, I won't be discussing uh, these three, but I would like to uh, say something about how GNH index is used in offshore decision making, uh, primarily in five ways. Uh, in technically specific ways. Firstly, in the national five-year plan, the uh, some 17 baseline goals are drawn directly from GNH indicators, and they uh, um, this, this kind of baselines uh, relate to such things as mental health, safety level, uh, community vitality as a whole, skills, voting turnout, fundamental rights, uh, values, assets, income, housing, etc. And the composite GNH index, which I call scholar, the single number index, itself is a national ba baseline. Uh, second way it is used is that uh, uh, the GNH index is used as a weighted criteria in the allocation of budget uh, to the uh, local governments. There are some 230 local government entities in Bhutan, and the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, second and third tier of vertical organization of the government. Uh, GNH index itself uh, carries only about 10 to 15 percent weight in the uh, distribution of money to the local government, um, but uh, uh, that is further complemented by the fact that the uh, other variables, uh, weights used for distribution of money is already collinear with the G GNH index itself. The third uh, technical way how GNH index is used is that the policies of the government are screened uh, with the GNH policy screen tool, which is a simple way of checking the impact of a particular policy on 22 criteria which are drawn from GNH index. So uh, uh, a number of policies uh, every year are screened, vetted through this measure, and if it doesn't pass the screening um, um, the required minimum uh, percentage, they get revised. A fourth uh, way it is being used is that uh, we have uh, done it only once, I must say, uh, that is that the GNH index is used to evaluate our projects uh, but in this particular case, we did uh, through uh, propensity score matching technique. Uh, a big horticultural uh, impact uh, in eastern Bhutan was assessed, um, uh, assessed uh, to show difference uh, in the benefit and the loss of the project to both beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries, a comparative exercise. And uh, the uh, last one, uh, uh, former Prime Minister already mentioned, uh, that is that GNH certification for business has been designed for assessment and framework for various uh, business corporation. And it's uh, somewhat uh, bigger scale implementation will begin only this year. But there are other applications of uh, GNH uh, taking place in a slightly more dispersed way, and we, do, we can't do surveys on this sort of thing. As a discourse in politics, this is former Prime Minister mentioned, in media, in education, in health, in the civil service, uh, uh, as, uh, me, uh, uh, and all this suggests that it is also vying for 
its place in a sort of context, con contesting um, space of ideas. Um, uh, now I would like to uh, give you um, uh, a glimpse of what changes do we notice through GNH index in the society as far as we know from uh, uh, the immediate two surveys, uh, 2010 and 2011, uh, 2015 survey. Uh, but I, I can only uh, manage to uh, give you a compressed view of uh, three domains. Uh, and I um, would like to do it through community vitality, time use, and psychological domain. What changes do we see? Uh, I chose this also because uh, it has a little bit of universal flavor and relevance to everybody. <clears throat> uh, between 2010 and 2015, and the overall uh, index of GNH improved, uh, but the improve is uh, extremely decimal, uh, you know, marginal, from 0 0.743 to 0 0.756. Um, so it's not going to excite any journalist uh, 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 because it is uh, going up only by 0.35% per year. Uh, uh, the main reason for this kind of marginal forward movement in GNH index is that it consists of a vast number of variables, 277, and uh, in the overall forward movement of many of these variables, there is inevitably a, a number of them which is going backward. And that is the, I think, uh, if you like, the ambiguity of development. If you um, put microscopic uh, um, um, view of things, there seems to be many things which we value which slide backward. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, as expected, the living standard domain, uh, which consists of housing, assets, and income, is the fastest moving uh, part of GNH index. But uh, unfortunately, because of the weighting we have uh, decided to give it, one ninth, uh, it cannot swing or it cannot drag the GNH index forward very much. Uh, the nine domains on the whole uh, seems independently important as goals that would increase the probability of achieving happiness. And therefore, they are given equal weights. Uh, I, I would like to illustrate uh, this with examples, a uh, uh, few examples. Uh, the first with the time use one. I think the uh, balance sheet of time use over 24 hours uh, definitely influences our well-being uh, of every individual. Uh, how the composition of leisure activities and duration and quality of sleep changes matter as much as well-being at workplace. Uh, but things like sleep uh, is uh, just now not a major focus of attention, uh, but I think it's crucial to uh, every individual. Uh, cultural activities, socialization, community events, entertainment, sports, mass media are main events of leisure uh, in the GNH uh, categorization. The national average time spent on uh, leisure, for example, in 2015 was three hours, 24 minutes for this uh, uh, constellation of activities. Over the five years between 2010 and 2015, time use has shifted by a margin of few minutes from each activities. And these activities are, it has shifted from personal hygiene, resting, eating, listening to music, cooking, physical exercise, to attending meetings, surfing nets, receiving Buddhist teachings, circumambulating, laundry, praying, cleanliness, upkeep, and above all to TV watching. Uh, TV watching made the biggest gain in five years. 
by 23 minutes uh, in, the, uh, in the country. And the participant uh, mean of TV watcher also increased by 17% during that speed period. The biggest loss was caused in physical hygiene uh, time, uh, going to the toilet, uh, makeup, dressing, and so on and so forth, by about eight minutes in five years. But we think that this may not be a qualitative loss. It may be a reflection of the fact that uh, convenience uh, and proximity of new sanitation facilities have reduced the time, but the quality of service might have improved. Uh, leisure time, uh, as I mentioned, uh, not only generates more happiness, but uh, happiness per given hour, but some say that leisure time is often the only time when we realize we are happy. <laughs> At other times, we are too busy to experience moment-to-moment -moment, uh, uh, well-being from experience. Uh, some regard commuting time as a defensive expenditure. That's a necessary expenditure to the market economy. Uh, not um, compensated to you um, necessarily by the employing agency. A minimum of seven hours of sleep rejuvenates our mood and functionality for the next day. Everyone knows this. And, but I think that sleep may be the biggest unpaid service we perform to the market economy. As leisure and sleep constitute two thirds of our life, I think that one ninth weight in GNH index doesn't seem excessive. Community vitality indicator also showed marginal drop. Uh, this may be a global phenomena, but only question is uh, how much do we measure those things? And it dropped marginally due to decrease in sense of belonging to and decrease in sense of trust in neighborhood decrease in perception of safety, mainly in urban areas, a decrease in donation of money and time, and decrease in good family index. Yet the monetary value of unpaid services provided within families and communities is very large in Bhutan, even though there is this decrease. The total monetary value of three categories of unpaid works household work, caregiving, and voluntary and community work is 25% of GDP in 2015. So we think that it certainly warrants one ninth weight. Uh, uh, if you monetize it, it's such a, such a huge, uh, uh, huge contribution uh, to strengthening society renewing bonds. Uh, since unpaid caregiving and household works are mainly performed by women, the monetary value of women's contribution in this regard is really 18% of the 25%. Um, GDP calculation takes account of depreciation of physical capital, yet depreciation of community vitality and social connectedness is thoroughly neglected. Uh, within GNH data set, suicide ideation and severe psychological distress, which is experienced by about 3% of Bhutanese population, are highly correlated. And social, uh, severe psychological distress falls more heavily on female, rural, divorced, widowed, unhealthy, financially insecure, and also, according to our data, highly associated with angry people. Uh, loneliness is another form of a depleted community, and uh, it's a, a form of atrophied relational death. 
debt. Uh, as anywhere, I think, the factual situation of loss, whether it is death or separation, uh, cannot be changed. But what we can endeavor to do is change the meaning of it in our life. Uh, and the springing of mindfulness uh, initiatives, such as uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, recent political charge uh, given to a minister uh, in the UK concerning uh, loneliness uh, suggests some sort of change is taking place here too. And uh, I, I do wish that uh, out of this sort of efforts will come much greater uh, mindfulness, much greater social connectedness, much greater intention, uh, uh, and much greater attention to each other. Um, as you know, uh, social connection, disconnectness can uh, physiologically manifest in inflammation, hypertension, and even depression. And it is at this stage that the boundary between uh, physical, psychological, somatic, psychic, social, economic, all dissolves. Um, and so in this respect, uh, I'm very uh, thoroughly delighted that this entire um, uh, International Society for Bhutanese Studies conference is undertaken in collaboration with the Samuel Center for Social Connectness, uh, who is focusing on creative ways to address social isolation. Uh, at the end, I feel that social connectedness and social responsibility is rooted thoroughly in positive emotions. That this is where it rests, finally, in positive emotions of generosity, of compassion, uh, and of calmness. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, overcoming of... Uh, Training indeed, not just overcoming, but we need to cultivate training of uh, avoidance of incidents of negative emotions like fear, selfishness, and anger, which these are all part of GNH survey under psychological well-being. Uh, in GNH data set, coming uh, to the end of my uh, uh, talk, uh, anger, for example, is highly correlated with victimization, which is in turn related to family disagreements, widowhood, surprisingly high room ratio, crowding leads to some sort of irritation, which is prolonged and chronic, it seems. Financial insecurity perception, self-reported health status. And victimization is inversely related to a sense of belonging and freedom of speech from our data. So broadly, our research show that each individual needs substantial subsistence good, but flourishing and happiness after this point is substantially relational matter. But this is nothing uh, surprising. This is, once again, just confirmation of what we knew all along only, with a few numbers to support that old belief. So the broad implication of this is that restoring relational disruption should be the way, main way of resolving unhappiness and suffering by policy and by individual action. By individual action, I think we all try to endeavor to do. Where the fourth king made a difference uh, beginning to grow now is that we need to do it by policy uh, action. And that the basic preference of human beings for happiness, for calmness, uh, for uh, well-being 
in its various form. Uh, this is the basic preference of human beings and one should add also animals. But if this is so, then all the institutions need to endeavor to reflect this value. Uh, this is the main point he made, in my opinion. So in conclusion, I would like to say that all around the world, uh, one trend is the, the commodification and displacement of social connectedness and relationship, commodification and displacement of subsistence good and services, which also should not be marketized, in my opinion. The disruption and commodification of local capacities and diversities. This is taking place in many parts of the world at a very alarming rate. And I think uh, I'd like to end that we should dedicate ourselves and our gathering uh, this evening uh, in the course of my humble talk. Uh, we should dedicate to better pattern of relationship as the key to well-being and happiness. I like to end by the typical Bhutanese word, uh, which is used both as greeting and ending, uh, Tashi Delek, and which means Tashi Delek. It means uh, auspiciousness, well-being, and beauty. And since these are three interrelated cardinal values. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dasho, for such a, a calm and yet intellectually exhilarating lecture, um, which spanned many things that we would study from concept to data collection, from measurement to policies, um, to restoring relational disruptions and rewriting um, emotional imbalances. Uh, the journey is a very long one and it can't be packaged into any one part. It was a thoughtful exposition that couldn't, in a sense, be collapsed into a measure or into um, any simple exercise. It required engagement and understanding. Um, and yet, uh, it's very fascinating to see a map of the route that Bhutan has taken um, to put into practice this compelling idea of gross national happiness. And so we now turn to really reflect a bit on what others might be able to learn from this experience. We have two discussions for this session, Professor James Foster and um, Ms. Martine Doran, as the Vice Chancellor said. Uh, Professor Foster, um, to uh, recognize our first commentator, is a highly cited and far-sighted economist, economic theorist, welfare economist. He's currently the Oliver T. Carr Professor of International Affairs and Professor of Economics at George Washington University. He received his PhD in economics from Cornell and holds a doctorate honoris causa from Universidad Autónoma de Estado de Delgada in Mexico. Trained as a mathematician, Professor Foster's 1984 econometrica paper, written while he was still in graduate student school, so graduate students might bear note, um, defined the foster greer thorbeck class of decomposable poverty measures, which remain the most widely used uh, poverty measures in practice. Since that time, Professor Foster has written fields defining papers in poverty measurement, poverty orderings, 
inequality measurement with Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, as well as on literacy and distributions and game theory. An advisor to many institutions, especially the World Bank, he has an uncanny ability to link formal axioma axiomatic structures to empirical applications and strategic thinking. Indeed, he taught a course on strategic thinking and game theory. From 2007, as a researcher with OFI at this university, he extended his class of measures um, to multidimensional space, and we had the honor to work with him, and this has similarly been applied widely. Professor Foster is well placed to comment on the GNH index on its measurement methodology, and on how this might link to economic theory and contexts outside Bhutan. Professor Foster. Thank you, Sabina. Hello. Well, thank you again, Sabina, and uh, also the International Society for Bhutan Studies for the kind invitation to comment on this very comprehensive presentation by Dashikama Ura. Excellencies, Vice Chancellor, President, and friends, and colleagues. Like the presenter, I first saw Oxford in 1982. At that time, I was a newly minted professor visiting the London School of Economics down there. When he went out of the blue, Professor Amartya Sen called me with an invitation to All Souls, where he was then Drummond Professor. We met in central London and drove, or rather flew, to Oxford in his yellow alpha suit. I bet the average speed was about 120 kph, with spikes of 140. But fortunately, the conversation on impossibility theorems and measurement was most engaging, and it kept me blissfully unaware of the danger I was in. <laughs> Fifteen years later, Oxford University Press would publish our joint work on inequality, updating Sen's masterful Radcliffe lectures on economic inequality. And then 15 years later, I had the distinct pleasure of spending a productive Trinity term as visiting fellow at Maudlin College. So, Dashikama Ura, I celebrate your 37 years of pleasant Oxford memories. May we share many more in the future. Now back to the business at hand. How should we view this gross national happiness index? Fortunately, you have just heard an authoritative presentation on the origins, motivations, and applications of this remarkable policy tool. My task here is to communicate and clarify the underlying structure, its essential simplicity and flexibility, which make it suitable as a social index. Please be aware that I am rather biased, as this structure was drawn from a paper I wrote with Sabina Alkair that appeared in the Journal of Public Economics. The so-called Alkair Foster method is a general framework for measurement, evaluation, and policy. It was originally created to measure poverty when there are multiple incommensurate dimensions in which a person might find his or herself deprived. First, it looks at each person's deprivation profile to address the question, who's poor? Then it looks across the entire population to address the question, how much poverty is there out there overall? The first is the identification step, and the second is the aggregation step. The Alkire Foster method does not solve these two steps. Rather, it provides a framework for solving them, an approach that requires hard decisions to be made before we can get anywhere. Four basic questions must be answered. First, what are the key dimensional variables? Second, what is the deprivation threshold level below which a person is considered to be deprived in a given variable? Third, which deprivations are seen as being more important and which are less? Or more generally, what is the relative weighting of the different deprivations in evaluating how multiply deprived a person is? Fourth, what is the overall threshold 
at which a person is sufficiently multiply deprived to be considered poor? The answers to these four questions provide an immediate solution to the identification step. A poor person is one who is sufficiently multiply deprived. It also suggests a simple measure of individual poverty, namely the sum of the weights of deprived deprivations, of deprived dimensions, or breadth of deprivation. That's in the case that a person is poor. If a person is non-poor, of course, individual poverty is zero. The Alcar Foster measure methods use um, individual poverty levels to solve the aggregation step. It simply measures overall poverty as the average individual poverty level. We call the resulting measure the adjusted headcount ratio, or M0, for short. As an example, suppose there are four equally dimensions, equally weighted dimensions, and two deprivations are needed to be poor. Then if I had three deprivations, my poverty level would be three quarters. Since there are four needed, I'm missing three, three quarters. If you had one deprivation, your poverty level would be zero because you're not poor. And overall, it would be the average of the two numbers. M zero would be three eighths. So our approach to measurement makes heavy use of axioms, what I call little nuggets of policy. Invariance axioms specify what information to ignore. Symmetry, for example, requires that if you and I exchange identities, overall poverty would be unchanged. Dominance axioms specify how the measure should respond to certain changes in the data. Dimensional monotonicity, for instance, requires that when a poor person takes on an additional deprivation, overall poverty should rise. Finally, subgroup axioms relate overall poverty to subgroups of the population or of dimensions. Population decomposability, for instance, in that FGT paper, requires overall poverty to be the weighted average of subgroup poverty levels. Subgroup axioms allow the anal analyst to see how the dimensional composition of poverty varies across population groups and evolves through time, hence is very policy relevant. This is the structure underlying the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index, or MPI, produced by OFI and the United Nations Development Program each year. It is also the structure of the MPIs produced by some 40 or so countries. The general structure is the same, but each country's poverty measure is calibrated individually by the country according to its own priorities with different answers to the above four questions. Of course, we can view the same glass as being half empty or half full. A more positive view of the same data would shift perspective to obtain an overall measure of achievement or well-being <clears throat> rather than of poverty. With this shift, the non-poor person has an achievement level of not zero, but one minus zero, or one. The poor person has an achievement level of not the breadth of deprivation, but of one minus that amount. The overall achievement level in society is then obtained by averaging up across persons. In other words, the positive perspective suggests the use of one minus M zero as a measure of achievement in society. In the above example, my, yes, hello, my achievement level is one quarter, while yours is one. So that overall achievement, one minus M zero, turns out to be five eighths. The measurement satisfies appropriately redefined versions of the axioms 
ensuring it is properly oriented and can be used for policy analysis. In particular, the subgroup properties of 1 minus M0 ensure that it can have significant policy relevance for targeting, for formulating policies, and evaluating changes. 1 minus M0 is the structure underlying the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index of USAID, produced with OFI's help, the Better Jobs Index of the Inter-American Development Bank, which measures employment conditions in Latin America, the new Statistical Performance Index of the World Bank, measuring the ability of countries to produce the statistics that are needed for directing policy. And most importantly for today's topic, the Gross National Happiness Index of Bhutan. It seems quite plausible that other countries could develop their own multidimensional measures of achievement or well-being based on 1 minus M0. Of course, calibrated individually by the country according to its own priorities with different answers to the above four questions, such a measure might be a plausible rival to GDP. To be sure, the method avoids many of the classic pitfalls associated with GDP and other measures. You don't get a measure that requires all indicators to be cardinal or with the same general scale. You don't get a measure that makes implausible assumptions about comparability across variables or which specifies trade-offs across all possible values without justification. In other words, you don't get a measure that's inherently non-robust. The approach doesn't leave all the hard policy questions to markets and market prices with all their well-known imperfections or to statistical tests that are data set dependent, or other methods that conceal the structure and provenance of the measure. And you don't get a measure that is de facto inappropriate for what you are trying to measure. See Kuznets on GDP. What you do get is a measurement method that is in principle easy to understand and communicate once the hard decisions have been made, that is policy focused with understandable goals in each dimension and across dimensions that can be broken down to any degree of disaggregation needed for effective policy analysis, but has communication friendly headline figures analogous to GDP, including the headline figure and the sub indices, and that can handle ordinal, qualitative, and mixed data with ease. And that is axiomatically appropriate. Note the GDP has many contradictory implications. It has not been subjected to even the most basic of axiomatic tests. For example, Pauli Lahola, former statistician general of South Africa, recently published a short piece illustrating just how easy it is for GDP to rise as well-being falls there's an axiomatic test lurking in there. To help this process along, Sabina and I are now studying the, the properties of 1 minus M0 as a measure of achievement or well-being, and in particular, how it might be linked to other constructs for economics. Meanwhile, economists are continuing to search for alternatives to GDP that are more linked to people and to the dimensions that are valued. Is 1 minus M0 a plausible option? I think that the GNH index provides tangible evidence that it is. What do you think? Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, James. Um, I'm now very delighted to introduce Martine de Rand from OECD, who will be our second commentator. 
As the Vice Chancellor mentioned, she is the Chief Statistician of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, overseeing all of OECD's statistical activities. She graduated in mathematics, statistics, and economics from the Paris uh, University and the Ecole Nationale de la Statistique and in the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Ms. Durand became Chief Statistician in 2010. And since 2011, the OECD published the Better Life Index, a composite measure of well-being across 11 dimensions, which have some com components that can be compared across countries and others that are context-specific. Under her leadership, the lovely phrase, measure what you treasure, came into currency among the statistics community, not known for such phrases. Uh, also, as many of you will remember, and as was mentioned earlier, the Sarkozy Commission um, concluded that we should move away from an over-reliance on GDP. And under Martins de Varane's leadership, the OECD hosted the successor to this commission, the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress. And over six weeks ago, they released the report that Dasha Kama Uda mentioned in his address, which is co-authored by Joe Stiglitz, Nobel laureate, Martin Durand, and Jean-Paul Fetussi. So the question of today might be, how can the work of Bhutan on gross national happiness and well-being and policy, which has developed and grown in the same period as the Better Life Index and the successor to the Stiglitz and Fetussi Commission, how can they complement one another? And how can they supplement the powerhouse of thought on GDP and its successors that is ongoing in the OECD? Martin Torrand, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you for, very much for being here at this late hour. Um, first of all, I want to thank the um, International Society for Bhutan Studies, and in particular, Sabina Alcara, for having invited me. Uh, to um, present my, but essentially the OECD views and comments on the uh, very interesting presentation by Dasho Kama Ura. So, um, Vice Chancellor, um, former Prime Minister, whom I think had other obligations, but that's fine. Uh, oh, sorry, I had, <laughs> all right, <laughs> hello then. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure really to be here to, tonight. First of all, let me again uh, compliment uh, Dasho Kamaura and the GNH team for really having been among the forerunners uh, in the well being agenda, proving that it is possible to produce a metric that resonates with the cultural specificities of a country but that can also stand the strand of time, and that has been used to inform domestic policies, really. I also want to praise Bhutan for its international leadership in driving the 2011 UN resolution on happiness and well-being. Actually, I was at the UN when this resolution was adopted. Um, and I also remember that there was a very nice video um, intervention by Prince Charles at the time. Uh, as has been mentioned several times, um, at the international, and perhaps you know, at the international level, uh, the OECD has indeed played a leading role in moving forward the agenda on measuring economic performance and social progress, and in particular, in implementing the recommendation of the Stiglitz and Fitusi after uh, the, their report was issued in 2009 and actually handed over to uh, President Sarkozy, who had commissioned uh, that report. The, the key motivation for the OECD to embrace this agenda was very simple. After the at aftermath, in the aftermath uh, of the great financial crisis, there was really a need, it was felt, uh, to develop and improve the capacity of OECD countries to improve their statistical systems, to go beyond GDP, 
and measure people's and households' well-being. And importantly, to prioritize policies around those goals. It was clear that too, for too long, GDP had been the single compass for measuring not only the performance of countries, but also the well-being of people. And we know that GDP is a very bad indicator of both the performance of countries and the individual well-being of individuals and of society. It measures the production over a period of time of goods and services and market goods and services. It doesn't measure a number of things that are important to people's lives. So the OECD reflecting um, in 2010 and 11 on its mission thought that it was important to move beyond GDP. But to move beyond GDP is not that required focusing on both the material conditions of people still, of course, but importantly to complement this with indicators on the quality of life. Looking in particular, something that GDP doesn't do because it provides an aggregate number, looking in particular at inequalities and disparities in all life dimensions for all groups of peoples. And considering the impacts of current decisions on the resources, such as the natural resources that are so important uh, in Bhutan, but also the social capital, which obviously uh, was uh, forcefully, a point forcefully made uh, before, that are very important for progress and for well-being to last over time. Well, while this may sound like a technical agenda, you know, developing new measures, new statistics, best left to statisticians, actually it has very strong political implications. Indeed, um, as actually was said in the Stiglison report, um, in many countries, one of the reasons that most people may perceive themselves as being worse off, even though aggregate GDP is increasing, is because they are indeed worse off, if you consider other aspects of life. So the idea that our metrics should focus on people's well-being rather than just on the size of the economic pie, if I may say so, and that GDP growth should be considered as a means rather than the ultimate objective of policy, and the si simple and single gauge of a co country's performance was really recognized at the OECD and in its new motto that became, in 2011, better policies for better lives. Consistent with this approach, at that time, we also launched the OECD Better Life Initiative. And we developed a framework for measuring well-being. And here I should say, there are lots of commonalities between the GNH and uh, our own approach to measuring well-being, our defining well-being. One thing is that we both focus on outcomes for people. Outcomes, that's what matters to people you know, whether they're in good health, whether the education system is providing quality and affordable education, um, and so on. Uh, and not just how much you spend on health, or how much you spend on education, because you can spend a lot and not get the outcomes, desirable outcomes for people and society. So, focusing on outcomes, as I said earlier, emphasizing the distribution of personal achievements. It's very important to go beyond the aggregate. We had been going through the aggregates for too long. What matters, and you know, you can see what's happening in my country, in France today. I'm sure you've all read about the yellow or heard or seen on television, the yellow vests. You know, you could say France is doing well, right? I mean, it's a country that's doing well, but there are lots of people that have been left behind even in a country like France. So looking at disparities is very important, the distributions, but also recognizing the importance of both objective factors, but also subjective factors. We heard that already several times. There are also a few differences, I should say. Um, first, 
we rely on a dashboard of indicators um, rather than the one single indicator such as the GNH. But it's because, probably because we are an international organization and it's very difficult actually um, to come up with um, consensus on the weighting system across countries. So while the possibility to disaggregate the GNI by groups and localities and other um, ways to disaggregate and the use of a common zero to 10 scale that uh, James Forster just mentioned uh, before across all items, which allows grouping uh, people by deprivation levels are clear advantages of the GNH relate, relative to other composite indices. The choice of weights remains from an international organization's perspective again, such as the OECD, a too normative and political one over which we don't feel that we, oh, you know, as an organization, international statisticians, have much to say and where it would be very difficult to reach consensus. Weighting each of the binary zero below threshold, one above threshold, and so on results requires deep expertise and, you know, difficult choices. That's what you said, uh, James, just a moment ago. Um, and sometimes there is um, expert, there are, there is expert or political consensus, but other times, and you can believe me, <laughs> having discussions with 30 things countries, um, it's simply impossible uh, to, for us to set a meaningful uh, and to find um, to a consensus on what good means for everyone. In other cases, it is also simply impossible for us to set a meaningful target. Where do we put the threshold? So uh, here, that's a, a difference. Um, perhaps we also uh, distinguish more clearly, but having heard uh, the former prime minister, I think I should revise my notes, because I was going to say, perhaps we, uh, in our framework, distinguish more clearly between current well-being and sustainability, while the two are more mixed in the nine dimensions of the GNH. We at the OECD in our framework cons consider four capitals that help sustain well-being over time. Natural capital, human capital, social capital, and economic capital. Some of these elements are woven into the uh, current well-being elements of the GNH, but not all. Um, but now I should say that that's probably because in Bhutan, the natural capital in particular, but the social capital as well, are in, enshrined in the constitution. So why would you want to add them into your indicator set? They're there, they're part of the country. Uh, but for other countries, that's not the case. You know, we're all combating climate change, as you said, and there are a lot of countries that are still not there. So we believe that to help those countries, it is important that we focus on those four capitals um, in order to uh, make sure that uh, these four capitals are critical from a policy perspective, uh, since they are the intergenerational assets that governments has responsibility to manage. They are central to ensuring long-term sustainable well-being. They include many of the collective of public goods that Kama Ora mentioned in his remarks. I should have mentioned in terms of commonalities um, that the dimensions that we have chosen at the OECD based on the experience and the um, uh, initiatives that have been taken in many countries are 11. And I'd like to list them because you will see how close they are to what is in the GNH. Um, income and wealth, jobs and housing that comprise the material living conditions, health, education, work-life balance, environmental quality, security, governance, social connections, and subjective well-being, which compose the um, quality of life. If I compare with the nine dimensions of the GNH, I find living standards, health and education, environment, governance, psychological well-being, time use, culture, and com community uh, stability. So as you can see, we are actually uh, very much, uh, we have a similar uh, framework. So I think that 
the differences then are not that great. But let me add that we did develop an aggregate index, the Better Life Index, despite all what I said. But we did not assign weight to this 11 dimension that I just mentioned. We left it to each individual, or societies for that matter, to decide on their own weights, and then to calculate their own index. And then, based on this, you can go on our website, there are nice flowers actually, I think the visualization is very pretty, um, that will tell you um, actually to which country you should move to, because that's a country where uh, you would find your preferences are satisfied, are met. Um, but beyond um, the work we've done on developing this framework and helping countries actually um, developing the indicators behind that populate this framework, we found out doing that that a lot of statistics were missing. They can, they can exist, they can be um, uh, there for one or two countries, but maybe not for all. And so beyond this, we've actually worked hard under the banner of the OECD Better Life Initiative to undertake a number of statistical activities to improve uh, the indicators and in particular to fill missing gaps, such as, for instance, developing guidelines on measuring subjective well-being, where we are now very proud to say that all but two OECD countries are collecting uh, on a regular basis subjective well-being data which comprise um, life satisfaction data, but also affect data or experience well-being, but also what we call eudaimonia, purpose in life measures. And that's very uh, important. So with this, we will be more equipped to link subjective well-being, as you've done in, in Bhutan, with um, objective uh, determinants um, of subjective well-being. We've also uh, developed guidelines on the distribution of household wealth because income is often referred to when we talk about inequalities, but uh, in disparities in wealth are much greater than disparities in income. Yet, this is something where lots of data are missing. Even the definition of wealth is different across countries, believe it or not. I'm talking about OECD countries here. so. Um, where uh, statistical systems are the most developed. We've also developed guidelines on the joint distribution of income, consumption, and wealth, because you can be rich in income, poor in wealth, or vice versa, and it's very important to look at the joint distribution, as well as metric to capture the benefits derived from unpaid household activities, which often, of course, um, are conducted by women. Now, the work on this continues, and as Sabina mentioned, in Incheon, Korea, just a few weeks ago, we've launched a report of the Stiglitz uh, Fitusi number two, of which I had the honor of participate, that details 12 recommendations to continue improving our measures of economic performance and social progress. But here I would like to make uh, two important points that are um, in this, from this report that I believe deserve to be conveyed to this, to this audience. The first central message is that what we measure affects what we do. As noted and as has been illustrated by uh, G, the experience of the GNH, as noted in the report, if we measure the wrong thing, we will do the wrong thing. If we don't measure something, it becomes neglected as if the problem did not exist. This is obviously true for governments as witnessed by the experience of the great financial crisis. In fact, the GDP loss that followed the crisis was not the temporary one-off event predicted by conventional macroeconomic models. The crisis had permanent effects on capital, in particular permanent losses of capital, of, of course, physical capital, machinery, machines and building and so on, but also hidden capital in terms of human capital, social capital, capital that currently we do not measure and do not measure well, but also lower trust in institutions, as you can see in many uh, countries. The second key message is that while metrics are needed, they are not enough. 
we need to anchor these measures in the policy process. Some of the most pro uh, promising uh, applications of well-being metrics we are looking at right now uh, is how to incorporate multidimensional well-being into existing tools of policies. This includes using well-being metrics to set national development strategies, such as in Colombia, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Scotland, Colombia, government targets, Sweden and Finland, budget priorities, like in Bhutan, in Italy and France, using well-being frameworks to structure policy appraisals, for instance, in extended cost-benefit analysis or regulatory impact assessment, and building well-being indicators into research designed to evaluate policy impacts. We are currently collecting case studies of countries' experiences in using well-being metrics to inform policy. But it's fair to say that there are a number of challenges that remain in this area. Countries are still experimenting, not like Bhutan, so they have a lot to learn from the Bhutanese experience with their well-being approaches. Nonetheless, it's clear that putting well-being at the center of policy analysis requires supporting conditions and the development of new infrastructure, a well-developed and accessible evidence base, the indicators, but also civil servants with the training, the tools, the capability to understand the analysis and interpret the findings, and perhaps most crucially, Leaders, we heard that the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister didn't consider him as a leader, but the king is a leader. And I think unless you have strong leaders, both politically and perhaps at also a managerial level, who demand greater use of well-being evidence in order to arrive at their decision, then you will not go very far. These leaders will only make these demands if they can see that the utility and the quality of the advice subsequent decision-making, and ultimately, people's lives is improved as a result of adopting a well-being lens. This means honestly evaluating the methods being developed and continuing to share knowledge and lessons among practitioners as we are doing today and as we've learned so much from Bhutan. So let me conclude once again by praising Bhutan for their achievements and thanking you very much for having given me the opportunity to participate in this session. I hope that we will continue to share these experiences uh, in measuring well-being, but more importantly, in applying those well-being metrics to improve the lives of people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dasha Karma Oda, to James Foster, Martin Delhand. Very much we want interchange, and we've been talking about relationships all evening, and yet um, it's 6.45, and Gross National Happiness also has a balance of time, and attending too, meeting, too many meetings is apparently not a good thing. So my suggestion is that we have informal conversations and continue because we have heard so much and as Martine said, uh, what we measure affects what we do, and there, there's a long and complex journey to follow after that measurement is enacted. And so I think we couldn't do justice to it in a conversation tonight, but I would like very much to thank our speaker, Dasha Karma Oda, to thank the two commentators for really in-depth and focused remarks. And my hope very much is that this conversation continues and that we together develop better tools um, to look at well-being not only in Bhutan but also in so many other contexts and that we do so with the relationality and restoring relationships at the center. Thank you so much. Tashi Dele.